Good evening, I'm Maravel Tarouk. The City of Toronto has issued another extreme cold alert, the 11th one so far this winter. Temperatures are expected to plunge to minus 17 degrees overnight. Kelda Yoon is live for us tonight at King and John. Kelda, minus 17, but it's going to feel much colder with the wind chill. Our apologies. We're going to try to connect back with uh, Kelda, who is live for us out there in those cold temperatures. Let's check in now, though, with Sophia, who's got a bit more of the specifics for us in terms of what to expect in the temperature, uh, certainly when we kick off uh, the new week. Sophia. We want to prepare to bundle up for back to school and work. It's going to be the first week in March, but it's certainly going to feel more January like as you mentioned that plunge happens into the overnight hours An extreme cold alert issued 11 times now when the temperature is forecast to be minus 15 or colder or a wind chill value of minus 20 or below. We will have that into the overnight period and even colder really for a frigid Monday morning as you're heading out the door with what feels like widespread into the minus 20s. Things only get modestly better when the sun plays a bit of a role and the daytime highs are at play into the afternoon. Now, here's the why behind this. We dodge a bit of a bullet, big system hammering the US Northeast and Atlantic Canada. We won't see that, it just scrapes by our south. But in the wake, we have a cold northerly flow and unfortunately, uh, while it's going to be a little bit gusty by the lake shores Monday, maybe with a bit of sun, this will only be the first of a few blasts of cold Arctic-esque air that we will have for this upcoming work week. So it's going to be a little bit of a quieter work week weather-wise, but of course the cost will be with this extreme cold. If you're going to be spending any time outdoors in the next 12 to 24 hours, dress in layers, seek shelter if outdoors for long periods of time, and try to stay dry. And of course the warming centers will be open at Metro Hall. Maribel. It's all good stuff to be mindful of. Thank you, Sophia. We'll check in with you in, in a little bit. Uh, and now we were uh, talking about this extreme cold alert. Uh, Kelda Ewan is live for us tonight out in that cold at uh, King and John. And uh, Kelda, just first of all, how is it feeling out there right now? It's getting there. I was out earlier, not so bad, but now you're really feeling the cold. It is going to continue to get colder, as Safia said, uh, minus 24. It's going to feel more like minus 24 in the overnight. The city, of course, advising people, if you don't have to go outside, don't do it. Dress in layers if you do have to go out and make sure your outer layer is windproof. Now, the bitter cold, however, not really the story of the winter so far. In fact, I spoke to some Torontonians earlier tonight, and what really struck them is how up and down the temperatures have been so far this winter. Did you hear that it's going to be minus 17 later tonight? No. Yeah, it is. It's going to be. Oh my God. It's not what people wanted to hear tonight, but many are also not surprised. It's going to change every moment, every night. It goes up and down, I feel like, rather than like a steady kind of like just regular winter. It's been going warm and then cold and then it gets warm again. This winter is temperamental. Uh, it doesn't know which way it wants to be. Their observations are on the mark. Environment Canada's Dave Phillips says we've been experiencing quite the yo-yo effect this winter as far as temperatures go. So for example, in, uh, in, in uh, February, we saw a high one moment, got up to 13 degrees, but we've also seen minus 19. Phillips says if we go back to November, it was cold. December, meanwhile, was relatively balmy, and January and February had its extreme ups and downs. When you average the hell out of it, you get something close to normal. For Michael Yaboa, the ups and downs have been pretty tough to deal with. I feel like that's much worse than consistent cold or, or no winter at all. For my, like, you know, emotional stability, I, I just, you know, I just need, I need some sort of uh, consistency. <laughs> Phillips says that's not likely to come anytime soon. I think that after next week, we're going to see a few more spring-like days. But you know, we have winter hasn't had its last hurrah yet. Are you sick of winter yet? I'm just about just about over it. Yeah. Now again, overnight is going to dip down to minus 17, minus 24 with the wind chill. Now this is the 24th day so far this winter that we've been put under an extreme cold alert. Now in comparison, last winter we saw a total of 31 days under an extreme cold alert, and if you go 
back a couple of years to 2016, we only had 12 days, so we have far surpassed that already. Maribel. Yep, I am with the I'm over it camp on this one. Thanks, Kelda. Well, the weather is bringing the cold temperatures to us here, but it is taking a much more dangerous turn. In Alabama, at least 14 people are dead after a suspected tornado. The storm destroyed homes, snapped trees, and flipped over cars. Much of the damage is in this small town of Beauregard, east of Montgomery. Emergency responders dug through debris, searching for anyone who might be trapped. They expect to be working right through the night. Well, Jody Wilson-Raybould says she intends to run again as a Liberal in her Vancouver riding in October's election. The former Attorney General and Justice Minister says she's already been confirmed as a candidate. But does she have the support of her constituents? Friar Stewart visited Wilson-Raybould's riding to check in. On a sleepy Sunday, Jody Wilson-Raybould's constituency office is pretty quiet. But on the ground, a show of support thanking her for her, quote, honesty and courage. I saw flowers out there on when I went out this morning and, and walked by and I thought, that's awesome. I'm glad people are supporting her. Still, Christina exactly. Parasini, um, who lives in this riding, know, like is unsure so what to think. I mean, I applaud her for standing up for what she feels has been going on. Uh, I, I still sort of don't not quite know who to believe on that one, though. A few blocks over, people walk and cycle along a busy parkway, and those willing to interrupt their stroll with talk of politics had different perspectives. Really admire her for, for you know, kind of standing on her, you know, on her morals and her ethics. I'm deeply disappointed with the decisions that she made, and I think it's going to come back to haunt her. Hi, how are you? My name's Jody. The Vancouver Granville riding was added for the 2015 election. Wilson Raybould won it with 44 percent of the vote. 100,000 people live in this area. Granville Street, which runs the length of the riding, is a hub of restaurants and shops. Further to the south in the riding is the Unitarian Church of Vancouver, where today dozens gathered. And Jody Wilson Raybould's testimony. Reverend Stephen Epperson says the topic has come up frequently at church, and he's met with Wilson Raybould half a dozen times since she was elected. She really engages, you know, with people. He says most in his congregation aren't liberal voters. They lean further left. Still, they're supportive. People respect her, and I know that people in this rioting, at least people I've talked to, um, hopes that she runs again. A lot can happen between now and the fall election, which is when voters here will really get their chance to weigh in. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. Meng Wanzhou is suing the Canadian government. The Huawei executive whose arrest in Vancouver outraged China says proceedings against her violated her constitutional rights. From Vancouver, CBC's Zara Premji reports. On Friday, the same day as Canada announced the extradition hearing will go ahead against Meng Wanzhou, she filed a civil claim against the Canada Border Services Agency, the RCMP and the Government of Canada. This comes after the CFO was arrested on suspicion of fraud involving violations of U.S. sanctions on Iran and American prosecutors are fighting for her extradition. They believe she and other Huawei executives have been avoiding the U.S. since learning of an investigation into their activities. In the civil document, she claims she felt serious breaches of her constitutional rights when she was held, searched and interrogated at Vancouver International Airport on December 1st of last year. The claim alleges a deliberate and premeditated effort by CBSA officers to obtain evidence from Meng. It alleges the officers had a warrant ordering Meng's immediate arrest, but intentionally delayed that arrest under the appearance of a routine border check in order to get evidence out of her. The Federal Department of Justice has redirected comment to the CBSA, and a spokesperson says, It is not a practice of the CBSA to comment on legal matters that are before the courts. It's no surprise that Madame Mung uh, has brought charges against uh, uh, Canadian authorities because of the nature of the arrest. This has been a very important and uh, well-publicized story inside China. While tensions have already become apparent between China and Canada over the last three months due to Canada's extradition policy agreement with the U.S., experts say this civil suit could lead to more strain on the two countries' relationship. I don't think this was a tit-for-tat retaliation. 
Uh, I think rather that it is something that the Chinese were going to push, uh, 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 try to bring a suit, uh, but that it is going to be a, a stage in what's going to be these complicated legal back and forth. Meng has been living under strict bail conditions in her Vancouver home since her release in December of last year. Her defense team says she is innocent of any wrongdoing and the U.S. prosecution and extradition process is an abuse of legal power. Meng is expected back in court on Wednesday for the beginning of the extradition process and there's no word on just how long that could take. Zara Premji, CBC News, Vancouver. The U.S. House Judicial Committee is casting a wide net as it investigates allegations leveled against Donald Trump. Tomorrow, it is sending out 60 requests for information from members of Trump's family, business and administration. To begin the investigations, to present the case to, to American people about, uh, about obstruction of justice, uh, corruption and uh, uh, abuse of power. So Trump himself said Saturday his business dealings are being investigated because he claims there is no proof of collusion with Russia in interference with the 2016 election. Heart-wrenching history on these walls, the story of a Toronto couple surviving some of the darkest times in Canadian history. That's after the break.
The future of Ontario Place is still a big question mark, but this week some wheels will be in motion. The Ontario Place subcommittee is holding its first open meeting. City councillors and waterfront groups will be there, and as Talia Ricci reports, they're hoping residents will be there too with their suggestions. For some on their Sunday strolls on the Ontario Place grounds, the future of where they currently come to seek quiet time is on their minds. I'd love to see a return to a family place, you know, seriously a place where you can hang with your family all day and have fun things like it used to be. Having lots of landscape and like interesting features that make people want to be outside more. These are ideas that the city's Ontario Place subcommittee want to hear. You only get one chance to change it. You only get one chance to revitalize it. Led by Councillor Joe Cressy, the group is hosting its first meeting this week. He says the city and its residents should have a say. Coming out of this subcommittee will be a series of principles and recommendations for how the city should engage with the province and conversations about its future. Back in January, the province asked developers to submit ideas. It won't be considering residential uses for the land. Finance Minister Vic Fideli has said that nothing's off the table. Cynthia Wilkie is with Waterfront for All and hopes the process involves lots of public consultations. We think Ontario Place should reflect the Indigenous heritage of the area and strongly involve Indigenous groups in, in determining the future. Um, we want to see the heritage buildings like the pod and the Cinesphere protected and Trillium Park. Losing that waterfront space to something like buildings and corporate stuff is like, I think that's really valuable waterfront and I would hate to see it sort of kind of go to that. The government has also said it's not rushing to make any decisions. Tuesday's meeting is open to the public. It starts at 530 at City Hall. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. Meanwhile, a multi-billion dollar Canadian industry got a shake-up today. For the first time in 30 years, Canada has announced a new plan for the mining industry. Top of the agenda, environmental protection. But some experts say mining companies are already thinking green. Climate change is a material issue for companies and in, in the sense that it can have an impact on their operating performance, their financial performance, and their long-term prospects. The plan was unveiled today at the Toronto, in Toronto rather, at the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada's International Convention. It requires mining companies to not only manage the legacy of their past activities, but also to develop mines with low carbon footprints. A Toronto museum is bringing a dark time in Canadian history to light. The exhibit, curated by U of T master's students, focuses on the story of one couple. During World War II, thousands of Japanese Canadians were forced into internment camps. Among them were Harold and Hannah Kawasoe. Hawea Fadal has their story. Dad, the oldest. Don Kawasoe looks at photos of his parents hanging on the walls of Campbell House Museum. The exhibit tells the story of their lives. They're very proud uh, and I think determined to show that, you know, we're, we're good people. Harold and Hannah Kawasoe were born and raised in British Columbia in the early 1900s, but their Japanese heritage would eventually make them a target. They felt very isolated, that they were separated uh, and displaced because of what they looked like and their ancestry. During World War II, more than 22,000 Japanese Canadians were kicked out of their homes along British Columbia's coast and sent to internment camps around the country. Mom's family were at, a, at an internment camp called Tashmi, and uh, uh, Dad's parents and Grace were in Slocan. But after coming to Ontario, Don's father was hired as a gardener for businessman C.F. Wood. The fact that somebody gave him a chance to uh, show what he was capable of, I think he took the most of that opportunity. In 1948, Harold and Hannah married in Toronto. They lived the first three years of their new life in the attic above Wood's business at Campbell House, just one floor above the room where their photos hang today. What is it, what is it like for you being in here now? Uh, fascinating to think that uh, mom and dad actually lived in this space. The museum curator says the exhibit highlights an important piece of Canada's history. The house embodies 
as I say, 200 years of history. And um, this is the very first time that we have addressed the, the period of the Second World War and, and post-war. When asked how his parents would feel about it, Don says... You know, mom and dad, they just lived their lives. And to think that in the living of their lives, they were creating a story that now has meaning and, and hopefully a positive impact to others, uh, they would be very proud, I'm sure. The exhibit will run until April 1st. Hawea Fidel, CBC News, Toronto. There are more than a handful of proud parents in Ottawa tonight. A peewee hockey team in the west end of the city has won the Chevrolet Good Deeds Cup and a $100,000 grand prize. The team plans to put it toward the tornado disaster relief efforts in Dunrobin. It's a feeling for an 11, 12 year old kid, right? They, they feel like they're, uh, feel like they're, you know, they're rock stars, like I said, and they're, they're celebrities almost in their own community, and uh, they deserve it. It's, it's it was a very big surprise. I'm very excited, and it benefits the whole community. It's like, really hard to believe. Are you a celebrity now? <laughs> yeah. Yeah? How does that feel? Uh, it feels like a dream come true. They deserve it. The West Carlton Warriors from Dunrobin, a rural community in Ottawa's West End, were announced as winners yesterday. Over 300 teams from across Canada submitted videos of their good deeds. The Warriors entered a video of the team helping their community after that destructive tornado tore through their hometown last September. The team collected books and monetary donations for families affected by the disaster. They say winning the money feels great, but it is going straight back into their own community. Well, these young basketball players had their skills put to the test today by a two-time Olympian, no less. That story coming up on Toronto Late Night News.
Mississauga was the epicenter of all your road tripping dreams this weekend. The largest RV show in the country took over the International Centre. Fans from across Canada, even the United States, came out to the annual Toronto Spring Camping and RV Show. Return attendees say they are seeing younger buyers and flashier products. One of the things that shocked the heck out of me was the camper trailers that sit on the back of a pickup truck. I mean, you know, they're the price tag, but they're four seasons and they're just not the old trailers we used to see or that, or that we knew when we grew up. Okay. Yeah, it's quite impressive. It was a packed house as enthusiasts tour the latest RVs and campers and with 500 models on the floor, certainly was plenty to see. About 100 young girls from Toronto got to test their skills against an Olympian today. The girls took part in a basketball clinic led by Raptors 905 coach and two-time Olympian Tamara Tatum. Have a look. It's awesome. Um, it's really great because you get to build a community within these people who have the same interests as you, which is basketball and doing sports. So it's really great because you feel a sort of bond between the people who you play with. It's great. It's hugely important for the girls. It's a great experience. It builds so much confidence and opportunity for them. A lot of girls are dropping out of sport at a really young age and for them to feel empowered by seeing people like myself or Jillian to see that there's a lot of things you can do later on in life and be really successful not just within sport but just in life so to be able to get to connect with us I think that'll be really important for these girls to see that like, sports is awesome for you. Sure is. Great for them. Okay, we're checking back in with Sophia for a look at the longer range forecast. I mean, every weekend we have talked about an impending storm for the week. Anything different this time? Well, I can't wait to start talking about crocuses and daffodils and yes. sunshine and rainbows pretty soon. Um, we don't entirely escape the snow this week, but really this week is a story of cold. So we talked about the big plunge in temperatures over the next 12 to 24 hours. You want to prepare still for the type of temperatures. If you're going to be outdoors where exposed skin can still freeze in a matter of moments. Gusty for Monday, especially if you're by the lake shores. But let's talk a little bit about the potential potential for active weather. I want to draw your attention to this weak trough that passes by on Tuesday. Widespread flurries are possible, maybe a couple centimeters or two, but the bigger story is the core of the cold air that it brings in behind it. Because if you think Monday morning is going to be cold on Tuesday and Wednesday, what feels like minus 15 and minus 17 is the warmest that it's going to get. We don't really recover until next weekend when we're watching the potential of maybe a big Colorado low that could put a bit of a damper on some early March break travel plans. You gotta not let anything surprise you though in this transitional season. We've been as warm as 25 degrees on record and we've been as cold as almost minus 29. So don't let anything surprise you. March is a mixed bag, but you still have to be prepared for temperatures that could be very dangerous. Remember the extreme cold alert is in effect as a reminder. Temperatures minus 15 or colder and wind chill values of minus 20 or below. Yeah, lots to be mindful yeah. of. Uh, it is still winter. Thanks, Sophia. You're welcome. Good luck. And that is our show for you tonight. Thank you for watching. You can stay caught up on news anytime on our website, cbcnews.ca. Have a great night, everyone.